the master mason, death. Thy hand is weighty on the breast of him who lies within thy grasp. No power can raise the captive from his rest whom thy strong hand doth clasp. The tears of broken hearts do fall in vain. Their sighs are wasted o'er the grave. Thou lost to scorn the solemn funeral strain, for there is none to save. From age to age, mankind hath owned thy sway submissive bowed beneath thy hand. The hoary head, the infant of a day, the loveliest of the band. And thou hast struck the true and faithful now, the model of Masonic faith. It was a cruel and a dastard blow, stern, unyielding death. Yet, boastful monster, ye shall have release, thy weighty hand, relentless power, shall be withdrawn, and all thy mockings cease, and all thy triumphs o'er. The lion of the tribe of Judah come see in the heavenly east the sign. To rend the sepulchres, disclose the tombs, and place thee, monster, in. The Master Mason. The First Section. The Theory of the Degree of Master Mason. Brought to you by Masonic Audiobook Library. The degree of Master Mason is suggestive of government over men. The apprentice in the fellow craft draws the materials from quarry and forest, shapes them, removes them to the places designed for them, and raises them to the wall. This is physical labor. All this requires a designing head, a draughtsman, and a superintendent, and this is the Master Mason. The same necessity exists in speculative or moral masonry. To the master mason were entrusted the secrets of architecture, plans, measurements, and estimates, the weight, tenacity, and durability of materials, and all that learning needful to transform rude stones and the trunks of trees into edifices that should be the wonder and delight of the earth. With such transcendent privileges, there was coupled a heavy burden of covenants, and he was expected to exemplify before his fellow laborers every virtue and grace symbolized on the trestle board of the master builder. Going astray, these three degrees thus form a perfect and harmonious whole. The compass. The use of the compass, whose beautiful allegory was explained in a preceding grade, is peculiarly adapted to the present degree. Within its extreme points, when properly extended, are found the grand principles of friendship, morality, and brotherly love. No subject can more properly engage the attention than the humane and generous feelings planted by nature in the human breast. Friendship is traced through the circle of private connections to the grand system of universal philanthropy, but the brotherly love so well known to the Masonic family is one of the purest emanations of earthly friendship. A community of sentiment and feeling creates a community of interest, cultivated and cherished by every brother. Morality is practical virtue, of which so much is said in the preceding degrees. It is the journey of wisdom, pursuing and disseminating happiness. It is no cold speculation, but a living principle. St. John, himself one of the purest exemplars of these three virtues, has left it on record, that if a man says, I love God, and hateth his brother, lie as a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. So sings the Masonic lyrist. In the land of the stranger we masons abide, in forest, in quarry, on Lebanon's side. Yon temple we build it, its plans from above, and we labor supported by brotherly love. Though the service be hard, and the wages be scant, if the master accept it, our hearts are content. The prize that we toil for, we, eleven have it above, when the temple's completed, in brotherly love. Yes, yes, though the weak may belong, it will end. Though the temple be lofty, the keystone will stand. And the Sabbath, blessed day, every thought will remove, save the memory fraternal of brotherly love. The altar. The sacrifices made upon the Masonic altar are the bloodless offerings of the soul. David describes them when he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, God, thou wilt not despise. These may be individualized as sacrifices of our own will, of feelings of contempt, anger, and hatred, of tail-bearing and indiscretion, of selfishness and the indulgence of our passions. Such are the offerings made upon the open law and in front of the emblem of the letter G. Friendship, on wing ethereal flying round, stretches her arm to bless the hallowed ground. Humanity, well pleased, here takes her stand, holding her daughter, pity, by the hand. Here charity, which soothed the widow's sigh, and wipes the dew drop from the orphan's eye. Here stands benevolence, 
whose large embrace uncircumscribed takes in the human race. She sees each narrow tie, each private end, indignant, virtue's universal friend. Scorning each frantic zealot, bigot tool, she stamps on Mason's breasts her golden rule. The trowel. The master Mason is not restricted to a single implement, or set of implements, for his mystic work. But the most appropriate tool in his department is the trowel the emblem of peace used to spread the cement of brotherly love and affection. That cement which unites us into one sacred band or society of friends and brothers, amongst whom no contention should ever exist save that noble contention, or rather emulation, of who best can work and best agree. The parts of a building cannot be united without proper cement. No more can the social compact be maintained without the binding influence of love. Charity. So much has been said in other pages of this volume upon charity, or more properly love, that it would be superfluous to enlarge further upon this subject. No one has so clearly defined it as the apostle who so thoroughly experienced it, the evangelist John. His soul was filled with this divine emanation when he wrote, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. Brethren, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and honoureth God. He that loveth not, honoureth not God, for God is love. Brethren, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Under the term, charity, the Apostle Paul, in a masterly summing up of the subject, writes, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And now abide at faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Prayer. The posture of bended knees is often alluded to in Scripture. Solomon kneeled down upon his knees before the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. Ezra says, I fell on my knees, and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. Daniel kneeled on his knees three times a day and prayed. Paul says, I bow my knees unto the Father. As an appropriate form of lodge prayer, in which masons of all persuasions can unite without compromise of religious principle, the one entitled the Lord's Prayer is the most perfect. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. The foundation stone. When the Spirit came to Jephthah, animating his great heart, he arose, put on his armor, girt his loins about to part, bowed the knee, implored a blessing, gave an earnest of his faith, then, divinely strung, departed, set for victory or death. If a rude, uncultured soldier thus dray the wisdom from above, how should we, enlightened laborers, children of the sire of love how should we, who know, the wisdom, gentle, pure, and peaceable, make a prayerful preparation, that our work be square and full. Lo, the future, one can read it, he its darkest chance can bend. Lo, our wants, how great, how many, his abundant means can lend. Case your hearts, then, laborers, boldly, build and journey in his trust. Square your deeds by precepts holy, and the end is surely blessed. Vainly will the builders labor if the overseer is gone. Vainly gate and wall are guarded if the all-seeing is withdrawn. Only a successful ending when the work's begun with care. Lay your blocks, then, laborers, strongly, on the eternal rock of prayer. The second section. The second section is devoted to that combination of duties implied under the figure of the five points of fellowship, likewise to the most expressive arrangement of Masonic emblems, the broken column. These two subjects, inserted in the center of the Master's lecture, form in truth the very heart of the matter, and no Mason can be esteemed well instructed who does not familiarize himself with them. This section recites the historical tradition of the Order, and presents to view a picture of great moral sublimity. It recites the legend, the symbolical interpretation of which testifies our faith in the resurrection of the body and the immortality of the soul, while it also exemplifies an instance of integrity and firmness seldom equaled, and never surpassed. 
The Five Points of Fellowship. The old records succinctly declare that the master mason should not withdraw his hand from a sinking brother, that his foot should never halt in the pursuit of duty, that his prayers should unceasingly ascend for the distressed, that his faithful heart should equally conceal the secrets and the faults of a brother, and that approaching evil should be averted by a friendly admonition. The same thought is more elaborately conveyed in the following, from an author of the last generation. I when the necessities of a brother call for my aid and support, I will be ever ready to lend him such assistance, to save him from sinking, as may not be detrimental to myself or connection, if I find him worthy thereof. 2. Indolence shall not cause my footsteps to halt nor wrath turns them aside, but, forgetting every selfish consideration, I will be swift of foot to serve, help, and execute benevolence to a fellow creature in distress, and more particularly to a brother mason. 3. When I offer up my ejaculations to Almighty God, I will remember a brother's welfare as my own. For as the voice of babes and sucklings ascends to the throne of grace, so most assuredly will the breathings of a fervent heart arise to the mansions of bliss, as our prayers are certainly required of one another. IV. A brother's secrets, delivered to me as such, I will keep as I would my own as betraying that trust might be doing him the greatest injury he could sustain in this mortal life. Nay, it would be like the villainy of an assassin who lurks in darkness to stab his adversary when unarmed and least prepared to meet an enemy. V. A brother's character I will support in his absence as I would in his presence. I will not wrongfully revile him myself, nor will I suffer it to be done by others, if in my power to prevent it. Thus by the five points of fellowship are we linked together in an indivisible chain of sincere affection, brotherly love, relief, and truth. Another and even more beautiful comment upon the five points of fellowship is the following. I when the calamities of our brother call for our aid, we should not withdraw the hand that might sustain him from sinking but should render him those services which, while they do not encumber or injure our families or fortunes, charity and religion may dictate for the saving of our fellow creature. Two from which purpose indolence should not persuade the foot to halt, or wrath turn our steps out of the way. But, forgetting injuries and selfish feelings, and remembering that man was born for the aid of his generation and not for his own enjoyments only, but to do that which is good, we should be swift to have mercy, to save, to strengthen, and execute benevolence. 3. As the good things of this life are partially dispensed, and some persons are opulent while others are in distress, such principles always enjoin a mason, be he ever so poor, to testify his goodwill toward his brother. Riches alone do not allow the means of doing good. Virtue and benevolence are not confined to the walls of opulence. The rich man from his many talents is required to make extensive works, under the principles of virtue. And yet poverty is no excuse for an omission of that exercise, for, as the cry of innocence, ascendeth up to heaven, as the voice of babes and sucklings reaches the throne of God, and as the breathings of a contrite heart are heard in heaven, so a mason's prayers for the welfare of his brother are required of him. IV. The fourth principle is, never, to injure the confidence of your brother by revealing his secrets, for perhaps that were to rob him of the guard that protects his property or his life. The tongue of a mason should be without guile and void of offense, speaking truth with discretion, and keeping itself within the rule of judgment maintaining a heart free of uncharitableness, locking up secrets, and communing in charity and love. v. As much as required of a mason in the way of gifts as discretion may limit. Charity begins at home, but, like a fruitful olive tree planted by the side of a fountain whose boughs overshoot the wall, so is charity. It spreads its arms abroad from the strength and opulence of its station, and lendeth its shade for the repose and relief of those who are gathered under its branches. Charity when given with imprudence, is no longer a virtue, but when flowing from abundance, it is glorious as the beams of morning, in whose beauty thousands rejoice. When donations extorted by piety are detrimental to a man's family, they become sacrifices to superstition, and, like incense to idols, are disapproved by heaven. The Broken Column The broken column supporting the volume of divine inspiration. A virgin, of matchless beauty, weeping, supporting in her left hand a funeral urn, commemorative of the departed, and in her right hand a sprig of evergreen. Time, the great leveler and restorer, entwining her disheveled locks in his fingers this is the array of symbols now presented to the admiring eyes of the candidate. They are calculated to awaken every sentiment of respect, veneration, and fraternal tenderness on the one hand, 
and on the other to remind us, that although time may lay all earthly grandeur in ruins and deface the loveliness of all terrestrial beauty, yet there is imperishable grandeur joined to unfading beauty and eternal happiness in the world beyond the grave. T is done the dark decree is said, that called our friend away. Submissive bow the sorrowing head, and bend the lowly knee. We will not ask why God has broken our pillar from its stone, but humbly yield us to the stroke, and say, His will be done. At last, the weary head has sought in earth, its long repose, and weeping frayers have hither brought their chieftain to his close. We held his hand, we filled his heart, while heart and hand could move, nor will we from his grave depart but with the rites of love. This grave shall be garner, where we'll heap our golden corn, and here, in heart, we, eleven oft repair, to think of him that's gone, to speak of all he did and said, that's wise and good, and pure, and covenant o'er the hopeful dead, in vows that will endure. Brother, bright and loving frere, spirit free and pure, breathe us one gush of spirit, from off the heavenly shore, and say, when these hard toils are done, and the grand master calls, is there for every weary one place in the heavenly halls. The unfinished temple, the temple of masonry is ever in course of construction, ever unfinished. Into its walls successive generations of the wise and good are built, and while time lasts, and the end of all things is delayed, the moral structure is incomplete. But we need not fear its walls will crumble, or that the work will ever cease. The other societies of this world, empires, kingdoms, and commonwealths, being of less perfect constitutions, have been of less permanent duration. Although men have busied themselves through all ages in forming and reforming them, in casting down and building up, yet still their labors have been vain. The reason was to hear it and be wise, ye builders of the present day. They daubed with untempered mortar. They admitted into their structures the base, discordant, heterogeneous materials of pride, ambition, selfishness, malice, guile, hypocrisies, envious and evil speaking, which Freemasonry rejects. Hence their fabrics, unable to support themselves, tumbled to the foundation through inherent weakness or were shaken to pieces by external violence. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Assyrian, the Persian empires, the commonwealths of Athens, Sparta, and Rome, with many more of later date, where are they now? Fallen, 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 the weeping voice of history replies. The meteors of our age, the gaze of the world, they rose, they blazed a while on high, they burst and sunk beneath the horizon, to that place of oblivion where the pale ghosts of departed grandeur fly about in sad lamentations for their former glory. Such has been the changes and revolutions which, as a fraternity, we have seen. From the bosom of the lodge, seated upon an eminence, its foundations reaching the center and its summits the sky, we have beheld, as upon a turbulent ocean at an immense distance beneath us, the states of this world alternately mounted up and cast down, as they have regarded or neglected the principles described above, while, supported by them, the sublime fabric of our constitution has remained unshaken through ages. And thugs supported it shall remain while the sun opens the day to gild its cloud-capped towers or the moon leads in the night to checker its starry canopy. The current of things may roll along its basis, the tide of change and time may beat against its walls, the stormy gusts of malice may assault its lofty battlements, and the heavy rains of calumny may descend upon its spacious roof, but all in vain. A building thus constructed and supported is impregnable from without, and can then only be dissolved when the pillars of the universe shall be shaken, and, the great globe itself, yea, all which we inherit, shall, like the baseless fabric of a vision, pass away at the fiat of the master architect. Minota of the Grand Master. Dead. And where now those earnest, loving eyes, which kindled in so many eyes the light? Have they departed from our earthly skies, and left no rays to illuminate the night? Dead. And where now that hand of sympathy that welled, and yearned, and with true love overflowed? Heart of love, is the rich treasure, dry? Forever sealed what once such gifts bestowed? Dead. And where now that generous, nervous hand, that thrilled each nerve within its generous clasp? Will, it no more enlink the mystic band, hallowing and strengthening all within its grasp? Heart, eyes, and hand to dust are all consigned. It was his lot, for he was born of earth. But the rich treasures of his master mind abide in heaven, for there they had their birth. Abide in heaven. Zero. The enkindling trust. The record of his deeds remaineth here. 
The acacia blooms beside his silent dust, and points unerringly the brighter sphere. Then, though the shattered column marks his fate, and weeping virgin weeps the unfinished fane. Not altogether are we desolate. For zero, beloved friend, we meet again. The third section. Wisdom, strength, and beauty. This section is chiefly devoted to the explanation of the hieroglyphical emblems peculiar to this degree. As usually given, it presents many useful particulars relative to King Solomon's temple, a portion of which, in the present volume, are, for convenience sake, transferred to other pages. In the richness of its imagery, this section resembles the third section of the degree of entered apprentice. Wisdom, strength, and beauty. The emblem of the three pillars in this section alludes to the three immortal artists who contrived, strengthened, and adorned the sacred fane. Solomon, king of Israel, first in wisdom, in wealth, in favor with God and man, stands as the pillar of wisdom. His wisdom excelled, says the inspired historian, the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezrahite, and he man and Chalcor and Darda, the sons of Mahal. He spoke three thousand proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and five, and he spoke of trees from the cedar tree, that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and of fowls and of creeping things and of fishes. This is all summed up in this passage. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much, and largeness of heart even as the sand that is upon the seashore. This was our pillar of wisdom. Our pillar of strength was Hiram, king of Phoenicia, a nation of architects and mariners, whose furnishing of skillful builders and choice materials gave to King Solomon all the support necessary for his undertaking. Our pillar of beauty was Hiram Abiff, whose singular proficiency in all the works of the goldsmith, the brass founder, the dyer and weaver, the lapidary and the jeweler, gave the desired impetus to the adorning of the edifice. The columns and pilasters. Our monitorial instructor gives the due number of these outward parts of the edifice, by which the visitor from foreign nations, who was not permitted to approach the temple nearer than the outer courts, could form an idea of the magnitude and splendor of the interior. Of columns proper there were 1,453, of pilasters, 2,906. Upon other pages of this volume, a description of the porch and the courts is given, from which we deduce the necessity of so many columns and pilasters in the building. In the same connection, the lectures of the master's degree compute the numbers of the workmen as follows. Grand masters, 3. Masters, or overseers of the work, 3,300. Fellow crafts, 80,000. Entered apprentices, or bearers of burdens, 70,000. These were all classed and arranged by the wisdom of Solomon, that neither envy, discord, nor confusion were suffered to interrupt that universal peace and tranquility which pervaded the world at this important period. The materials that made up this band were virtuous and laborious, its master builders the Enochs, the Noahs, the Abrahams, the Moses, the Joshuas of the age. There was not a signal connected with it which did not point either to man's extremity or to God's opportunity, not a grip which did not speak of human relations demanding human sympathies, not a word that did not tell of power, permanency, or wisdom as the result of active, thorough devotion, for a ceremony which was not full of instruction upon, i.e. great divisions of human knowledge. Lodge Combinations The number of members essential to the legal opening and working of a lodge of entered apprentices is seven or more, of whom one at East must be a master mason. Where two or three assemble round in work the Lord approves, his spirit with the grasp is found, for it's the place he loves. Be now all hearts to friendship given, for we, the sons of light, are seven. The number of members essential to the legal opening and working of a lodge of fellow crafts is five or more, of whom, at least, two must be master masons, the other three being fellow crafts. This lodge of five from Tyre came, their leader one of matchless fame. All through the toiling season seven, their time upon this work was given. The number of members essential to the legal opening and working of a lodge of master masons is three or lower, all of that degree. A lodge attempting to operate in violation of these landmarks, breaks the unity if the sacred numbers 3, 5, and 7. The Moss 3 are who permits it violates in an especial manner his own covenants, and the lodge so offending forfeits the charter or warrant under which it works, and which in itself embodies an injunction to adhere to the ancient marks. The Three Steps 
This is an emblem recalling the various illustrations of the number three, and this additional one, that human life has three principal stages, youth, manhood, and old age. The first is symbolical of the entered apprentice, as suggested under the head of theory of the first degree, on a preceding page. Masons of that grade are therefore exhorted industriously to occupy their minds in the attainment of useful knowledge. The second step is beautifully emblematical of the fellow craft, who is exhorted in the lectures of his degree to apply the knowledge which he acquired as an entered apprentice to the discharge of his respective duties to God, his neighbor, and himself. The third step is emblematical of the master mason, who, in the enjoyment of those happy reflections consequent upon a well-spent life, prepares his mind for a blissful hereafter. Corresponding with this emblem the being of man has three periods time, death, and eternity. Upon one of these steps, every member our widely spread order is now standing. He who writes this and he who reads it stands upon the first, but who can anticipate the period of his stay? Upon the second hundreds are standing, gasping, tottering, perhaps dreading the illimitable profound that opens before thorn, while in the unknown existence of the third is the great mass of those who, like ourselves, have met upon the level, to part upon the square. The pot of incense. This is an emblem of a pure heart, and as such is peculiarly expressive. There is a state of perfection at which the good man may arrive by the influence of vital religion, and such is typified by this emblem. A pure heart perpetually ascends in perfumes of gratitude, like the cloud of celestial white that filled the temple, and like the heaven-descended flame that burned day and night within the sanctum sanctorum. Such is the offering of prayer, the most acceptable in sense the human heart can raise. Incense for the service of the sanctuary was ordered to be made of frankincense and other gums and spices, the materials and manufacture of which are particularly described in the divine law. It was the business of the priest to offer it up, morning and evening, upon an altar especially erected for this purpose, and this was called the altar of incense. The preparation of it for common use was positively forbidden. Neither could any other composition be offered as incense upon this altar, nor could this be offered by any but the priest. The incense approved by God under the present dispensation is more fragrant, more costly, and more acceptable than the rich est gums of Arabia. The service and the time of offering is in the option of every man. Whenever a Freemason looks upon the emblem, he should be reminded to make at least one ejaculation of thanksgiving, praise, or confession to him whoever heareth. The beehive. This emblem of industry has peculiar meaning to the members of a society based upon a working model. The slothful inactivity of the rational drone is severely reproved by it. The industrious bee rises early to the labors of the summer day, gathering from the variegated carpet of nature an ample supply of food for the winter of his year. Man, in imitation of this example, might enjoy all the necessaries and even the luxuries of life, while he would avoid vice and temptation and merit the respect of mankind. On the contrary, idleness is the parent of poverty and immorality. Such are the lessons taught by all the working tools the gauge and gavel, the square, level and plumb, and the trowel of the craft. Every day of the six properly devoted to labor should be so divided that while a share may be given to works of charity and devotion, and a share to refreshment and sleep, one measured part may be given to the avocations of life, those callings upon which the interests of society depend. The proverbs of the wise king abound in rebukes upon indolence and admonition to industry. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which provided her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, sluggard? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. The Book of Constitutions guarded by the Tyler's sword. So much has been said in this volume upon the importance of secrecy as a Masonic virtue that the application of this emblem will be easy. The Book of Constitutions, as an emblem, represents all the instruction, esoteric and exoteric, connected with the Masonic ritual. The Tyler of the Lodge, whose emblem, badge, and I am, Plement are the sword, is the guardian of those assemblages held for the purpose of lawfully communicating the secrets of masonry. Thus the sword guarding the book recalls to the memory of the initiate all the instructions communicated to him upon this subject. This emblem will convince the mason of the policy of preserving inviolably the important secrets which are committed to his breast.
Various passages from the Holy Scriptures are appended to enforce these lessons. Be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword that ye may know there is a judgment. Even a fool when he holdeth his peace is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue, keepeth his soul from troubles. As he that bindeth a stone in a sling, so is he that giveth honor to a fool. Discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. It will be observed, however, that with us the sword is but a symbol. There is no punishment in masonry for the highest crimes, beyond expulsion from the order. The sword pointing to the naked heart. This emblem is the complement of the last. The punishments of masonry, at the greatest, are but exclusion from the order. But although mercy delays the descending stroke of justice, there is a day appointed in which justice will be amply avenged, unless mercy shall secure us in the ark of her retreat. The sword of almighty vengeance is drawn to reward iniquity and pointed steadily toward the sinful heart. Were it not for this belief in retributive justice, how painful would be our observations of human life. All history is full of instances of the tyranny of the strong over the weak. How much sin against God and humanity is done privily, of which there is no disclosure in this life. Yet there is a righteous God, and he does not look upon these things without abhorrence. His law declares, The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. And if of judgment, who shall set me a time to plead? For he is not a man as I am, that I should consider him. I will say unto God, Do not condemn me. These are the lessons taught by this emblem. As surely as masonry encourages us to hope for a reward to the righteous in the world to come, so certainly does it inculcate the doctrine that there is punishment there for the evildoer. The all-seeing eye. This emblem implies that all the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. That the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good, and especially upon them that fear him and hope in his mercy. There is an eye through the blackest night a vigil ever keeps. A vision of unerring light o'er lowly veil and giddy height the eye that never sleeps. Midst poverty and sickness lay the lowly sufferer weeps. What marks the face convulsed with pain? What marks the softened look again? The eye that never sleeps. Above the far meridian sun, below profoundest deeps, where dewy day his course begun, where scarlet marks his labor done the eye that never sleeps. No limit bounds the eternal sight, no misty cloud oversweeps. The depths of hell confess the light, eternity itself is bright the eye that never sleeps. Then rest we calm, though round our head the life storm fiercely sweeps. What fear is in the blast? What dread to us has died? An eyes overhead the eye that never sleeps. The anchor and the ark. Under the emblem of hope, on a previous page, we explained the manner in which this first of the three theological virtues is inculcated to Freemasons. The ark, an emblem of that which survived the flood, reminds us of that ark of safety which will waft us securely over this sea of troubles, and when arrived in a celestial harbor, the anchor of a well-grounded hope will moor us forever to that peaceful shore, where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. This grace is equally important and pleasing in this world of uncertainty and change. The present moment is sure to possess some ingredient to embitter the chalice of mortal enjoyment, and how effectually are we relieved by the soothing hope that the deficiencies of the present day shall be supplied by tomorrow. The anchor, which is connected with this emblem is an emblem of security. When the visions of hope are real and rational, as when we hope in the promises of God, in a future state of happiness to the good, and the like, her anchor is sure and steadfast in the harbor of a celestial country. To this country hope points as the future residence of the virtuous and the good, thither all good masons hope to arrive. Green, but far greener is the faith that gives us victory over death. Fragrant, more fragrant for the hope that buoys our dying spirits up. Enduring, but the charity that masons teach will never die. The 47th Problem. The history of this problem is much confused. Some writers attribute its discovery to one person, some to another. Even the period of its discovery is doubtful, but so many of the most practical operations of architecture and surveying depend upon it, that it is difficult to believe its discovery bears a date later than the erection of the Egyptian pyramids. Its adoption into Freemasonry implies that the members of this order should be lovers of the arts and sciences. The hourglass. 
Life's sands are dropping, dropping. Each grain a moment dies, no stay has time, no stopping. Behold, how swift he flies. He bears away our rarest, they smile and disappear. The cold grave wraps our fairest, each falling grain's a tear. Life's sands are softly falling, death's foot is light as snow. Tis fearful, tis appalling to see how swift they flow. To read the fatal warning the sands so plainly tell to feel there's no returning from death's dark shadowy dale. Life's sands give admonition, to use its moments well. Each grain bears holy mission, and this the tale they tell. Let zeal then time run faster, each grain some good afford, then at the last the master shall double our reward. The scythe, this emblem is trite. As the mower cuts the grass in its season, death, the grim leveler, sweeps away the human race at the appointed time. Behold, what havoc the scythe of time has made in the generations of man. If by chance we should escape the numerous evils incident to childhood and youth, and with health and vigor, to the years of manhood, yet, withal, we must soon be cut down by the all-devouring scythe of time, and be gathered into the land where our fathers have gone before us. The emblems of mortality, at first view these emblems, the setting maul, the spade, the coffin, the open grave, and the sprig of evergreen at its head, seem but to add shades of gloom to those that have just been moralized upon, the hourglass and the scythe. Alas, who can look within an open grave without a sensation of profoundest melancholy? Is it for us, we mournfully ask, to resign our manhood and court though companionship of the worm? Must our eyes, trained to enjoy the charms of nature and of art, be blinded with these clods, our tongues silenced in this narrow receptacle? Yes, such will be our doom. A flowing river or a standing lake may their dry banks and naked shores forsake. Their waters may exhale and upward move, their channel leave, to roll in clouds above but the returning winter will restore what in the summer they had lost before. But if, man, thy vital streams desert their purple channels and defraud the heart, with fresh recruits, they ne'er can be supplied, nor feel their leaping life's returning tide. And such are all the lessons of human life. We walk from grave to grave, as one may walk over a hard-fought battlefield, and find no place for his foot save upon the image of his kind. The emblems before us demand the terror of fraternal sympathy, and we cannot refuse to weep. The frosts of death have palsied his mortal tenement. There is hope of a tree if it be cut down that it may sprout again. But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? As Freemasonry, in its three degrees, is an epitome of human life, so one who passes through its impressive ceremonial remains at the last under deep impressions of the certainty of death and the loathsomeness of the grave. But here steps in the qualified instructor of the lodge, the master, and the sad symbology opens out a brighter lesson. It opens out the brightest, clearest, most hopeful lesson of all. For it tells us what in the olden time was a Masonic secret. But now, since light and immortality have been brought to light in the gospel, is preached to every man, that, as this world is too. The good man but the tiling room of heaven, so the grave is the door of the celestial lodge where our grand master and the multitude of the faithful who have entered before us are waiting to receive us with tokens of affection and songs of transport. The soul remains unaffected, flourishing in immortality. Yea, though the body may decay into dust, and the dust be scattered to the 4W carat NDS, though our name and our memory may fade from the minds of men, yet there is one pledge to remember us, to awaken us when the morning hour shall come, to reach forth his strong hand and to assist us to arise from our long sleep. The lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. The omnipotent is the all-merciful. We shall rise again. Tuba mirum spargan sonora, per sepulchre regionum coget omnes antithronum. Charity, the shining virtue of charity, so honorable to our nature and so frequently enjoined in the holy volume upon our altars will appropriately close this chapter. There are none of the characteristics of the ancient craft so much valued as this. Their earliest records and their perpetual practice coincide in this particular. Charity includes a supreme love to God and an ardent affection for the rational beings of his creation. This humane, generous, heaven-inspired principle is diametrically opposed to the prime ingredient of human nature, which looks only to self. Not until this letter passion is supplanted by the former will the soul of man be purified and fitted for the society of heaven. The feelings of the heart, guided by reason, should direct the hand of charity. 
The true objects of relief or merit in distress, virtue in temptation, innocence in tears, industrious men borne down by affliction, acts of providence, widows left dependent and desolate, and orphans thrown in tender years upon the frigid charities of the world. Thus we close our comments upon the symbolical degrees. Every step in this part of the Masonic ladder will lift up the initiate further above the sordid level of humanity, and nearer to the celestial world, whose light, shining upon him through the first great light of the order wins him toward itself. Glorious system, which, while it the better fits a man for living in this world, so perfectly fits him for the world to come. And, dying late and honored, justifies us in pronouncing over his remains such a eulogy as this. So falls the last of the old forest trees, within whose shades we wandered with delight. Moss grown, and hoary, yet the birds of heaven loved in its boughs to linger and to sing. The summer winds made sweetest music there. The soft, spring showers hung their brightest drops, glistening and cheerful on the mossy spray, and to the last, that vigorous, ancient oak teemed with ripe fruitage. Now the builders mourn through temple chambers their grand master fallen. The clear intelligence, the genial soul, the lips replete with wisdom, gone, all gone. The ruffian death has met and struck his prey, and from the quarry to the mount all mourn. Bind up with asphodel the mystic tools and jewels of the work. Bind up, ye crafla, the square. It marked the fullness of his life. To virtue's angle all his deeds were true. The level, low one it leads us to the grave, thrice honored, where our aged father sleeps. The plum, it points the home his soul has found. He ever walked by this unerring line, let down, suggestive from the hand of God. Bind up, in mourning dark and comfortless the gauge, he gave one part to God, and God, in blessed exchange, gave him eternity. The trowel, in his brotherly hand it spread sweet concord, joining long estranged hearts. The hourglass, whence his vital sands have fled, and every grain denoting one good deed. The gavel, in his master hand it swayed for threescore years the moral architects, quelling all strife, directing every hand, and pointing all to the great builder, God. Bind these with asphodel. Enshroud these tools and jewels of the work. Let bitterest tears flow for the man who wielded them so well, but, overborne with death, hath, in ripe age, his labor fully done, passed from our sight. Closing thoughts on this degree. A lodge pursuing its work upon the design, and in the spirit of the foregoing lessons will realize the virtue expressed by the poet in the following lines. Where hearts are warm with kindred fire, and love beams free from answering eyes, Bright spirits hover always there and that's the home the Masons prize. The Masons' home. Ah, peaceful home. The home of love and light and joy. How gladly does the Mason come to share his tender, sweet employ. Asterisk all around the world, by land, by sea. Where summers burn or winters chill. The exiled Mason turns to thee and yearns to share the joys we feel. The Masons' home. Ah, happy home I the home of light and love and joy. There's not an hour but I would come and share this tender, sweet employ. A weary task, a dreary round, is all benighted man may know. But here a brighter scene is found, the brightest scene that's found below. The Mason's home. Ah, blissful home. Glad center of unmingled joy. Long as I live, I, eleven gladly come and share this tender, sweet employ. And when the hour of death shall come and darkness seal my closing eye, may hands fraternal bear me home the home where weary masons lie. The masons' home. Ah, heavenly to faithful hearts eternal joy. How blessed to find beyond the tomb the end of all our sweet employ. The next chapter shall be on the second order in Freemasonry. The capitular degrees, consisting of the Mark Master, the Past Master, the Most Excellent Master, and the Royal Arch Mason. The Masonic Ladder. A practical exhibit, in prose and verse, of the moral precepts, traditions, scriptural instructions and allegories of the degrees of Master Mason. Brought to you by Masonic Audiobook Library. Follow us on YouTube and all streaming platforms.